Welcome to the Private School Leader Podcast, where private school leaders learn how to thrive and not just survive as they serve and lead their schools. I'm your host, Mark Minkus. I have a rule for myself when it comes to engaging with social media, and that rule is is that I never read the comments. So if there's a post on Instagram or Twitter, there's always comments underneath it, and a rule for myself is to never read the comments. But every once in a while, I might, let's say on Instagram, I get a lot of stuff from SportsCenter or from, uh, let's say, NBA Highlights. And let's just say it's LeBron James dunking a basketball. It's a highlight from an NBA basketball game. And there might be a comment at the top. Sometimes it's from another athlete or celebrity. And I might click on that and then I get taken down that rabbit hole of comments. And I remember, oh yeah, that's why I don't read the comments because there's just so much negativity. And within a few comments on that post, it all of a sudden they're talking about politics and the president and racism and um, sexism and just a lot of different issues that of course are valid and real issues in our world but don't seem to really fit with a highlight from a basketball game and so that's why I generally avoid the comments. Every issue seems to cause people to take sides now especially in America And most people on social media are angry about something. And then you have the local and national news. And let's face it, they focus on the bad news because that's what sells. And sometimes the worst of humanity in these stories that we hear. And it's just easy to view life through a negative lens. But what about at school? What about when bad things happen at school and they look to us, they being the staff, the teachers, they look to us as being the one that's going to lead them out of that bad situation. And so, for instance, the pandemic, we all have experienced that. Recently, um, let's say several families leave the school. You send out re-enrollment contracts and the deadline comes and goes and you get a big surprise. It could be that there's a tragedy. God forbid that a student or a staff member dies or let's say there's a fire at the school or for some reason you have to relocate the building, the school. Let's say that all of a sudden several teachers decide they're not coming back and you have all of these positions to fill. Or maybe it's just really, really low morale across the whole school, across all divisions. And so when that happens, everyone's looking to the leader to fix it. How is the leader going to fix it? Well, one thing you can do to change all that for your teachers is by being the most optimistic person that they know. Now, you'll notice I did not say the most positive person that they know. I said optimistic. And on today's episode of the Private School Leader Podcast, we are going to talk about hopeful optimism, not toxic positivity, because you are going to lead your team out of this negative situation that they're in, but you're going to do it in a way that is optimistic, that is not toxic, and does not leave your staff scratching their head, rolling their eyes, thinking, well, they are completely out of touch with reality. So we're going to dive into the issue of hopeful optimism, not toxic positivity. But before we get into that, I just wanted to let you know that I've created a free resource for you called the top six ways to protect your school from a lawsuit. This is an eight page PDF that will help you keep your staff and students safe and also help keep your school out of court. Litigation is expensive, time consuming, and very, very stressful. And this common sense guide will help you to be more intentional and proactive when it comes to protecting your school as you lead your school. And you can grab the top six ways to protect your school from a lawsuit at theprivateschoolleader.com slash lawsuit. And again, that's just a thank you gift to you for free just for listening to the podcast as a way to express my appreciation for you taking the time each week to listen. And you can grab six ways to protect your school from a lawsuit over at theprivateschoolleader.com slash lawsuit. Okay, let's get into today's topic. Hopeful optimism, not toxic positivity. So let's talk about hopeful optimism, first of all. It's hopefulness and confidence about the future 
or the successful outcome of something. Okay, so that seems pretty straightforward. Optimism and pessimism are mindsets. And so we know people in our lives that are optimists and that are pessimists. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that it is important, though, for leaders to be optimists. And so it's a way of thinking. It's a way of seeing things. Optimists tend to see the positive side of things, and they just expect things to turn out well. And they believe that they have the skill and ability to make good things happen. So that's kind of the zone that you want to be in as a leader is that hopeful optimism. And we're going to talk specifically about how to stay in that zone and to not drift into toxic positivity. So you've probably heard that phrase, especially during the pandemic. And toxic positivity is the belief that your teachers should maintain a positive mindset no matter how difficult or how dire the situation. And so just picture this. You have probably seen the movie Titanic. If not, you know the story. But let's just pretend that the captain of the Titanic, as it's slipping beneath the surface, the ship is going down, the captain is just yelling, everything's fine, everything's fine, positive vibes only, everybody, it's great, just come on, just have a positive attitude, everything's fine. That's toxic positivity. You are not recognizing the situation and you just expect that everyone will maintain a positive attitude no matter what. And toxic positivity disregards the valid negative emotions of your teachers while taking positivity to an overgeneralized extreme. So let me just hit you with that definition one more time. Toxic positivity disregards the valid negative emotions of your teachers while taking positivity to an overgeneralized extreme. And you are not going to do this because I'm going to give you the eight ways to avoid toxic positivity by displaying hopeful optimism. And those are, number one, accurately assess the current situation. Number two, acknowledge the current situation. Three, paint the picture of a different future. Four, we are going to get through this. Number five, set the example. Number six, perform a belief transplant. Number seven, validate your teacher's feelings. And number eight, get to work. So let's get started with number one, accurately assess the current situation. So your teachers need a leader that can accurately assess what's going on. And so what do I mean by accurately assess? All right, so my wife and I, when we have time to watch TV, I don't know, everyone's, we kind of go through phases of the different things that we watch, but sometime in the past couple of years, we were watching this show called Air Disasters. And I don't know if it's on the History Channel or Discovery or where, but anyways, it takes a plane crash that happened somewhere in the world and it reenacts it dramatically, and then it really dissects the investigation that took place afterwards, and then it comes to the conclusion of what caused that problem. And with air disasters, what I've found most of the time, it has to do with human error. There are many times where it's mechanical failure, but a lot of times it is human error, and it's because the pilots did not accurately assess the situation. So that could be weather. It could be distance or altitude or fuel and just ignoring warning signs and thinking everything is fine. And so the pilots just did not accurately assess the situation and it led to disaster. And so I think that not accurately assessing a situation can lead to either a crisis in a moment or disaster over time. So let me explain what I mean. So crisis in a moment is like a plane crash or the Titanic striking an iceberg and sinking or a weather disaster and a poor response to that. But a disaster over time is something that just little by little things could have happened over a long period of time to make the situation better, but they didn't. And so For instance, 9-11 could be an example of a disaster over time, the Vietnam War, the Three Mile Island disaster. Um, And so those kinds of things where little things then became big things and became much bigger things, but it was over a long period of time. So how do we accurately assess the situation at our school to make sure that our teachers see us confidently in that way and see that we're in touch 
and that they can rely on us and depend on us. So for me, it comes down to situational awareness. And I'll go back to the Titanic example for a moment. So the Titanic, uh, the captain of the Titanic ignored many, many warnings. And the problem that night, it was, it was kind of a cascading um, event, a cascade of events that led to that striking the iceberg. But they had many, many warnings about icebergs in that area. They were told to change course and they did not because he wanted to make good time to get to New York City because there was a lot of media coverage on the, the trip of the Titanic. Also, it was very, very calm in the North Atlantic that night, which means that the spotters that sit way up in the bird's nest on top of a ship in those days, this happened in 1912, the way that they would see uh, icebergs would be that they would see the waves bouncing, crashing off of the iceberg. Well, when the sea is extremely calm, there are no waves against the iceberg. And then the other problem was is that it was a new moon that night. So no natural light other than the stars. And for all of these reasons, there were all kinds of warnings to change course and to not go through where all of the icebergs were. So situational awareness. As hard as it is, you have to remove the emotion and accurately assess the situation. And I did an episode a while back called the leadership lessons from the top of Mount Everest. And one that I'll remember very clearly is that there was a all woman team from the United States and they got to within, I think it was 200 feet or a hundred yards of the top of Everest. And the leader of that team decided to go back and turn back and they did not summit Everest that day. And she said that the goal is to not reach the summit. The goal is to come down alive with all of your fingers and toes. And so my point is, is that as hard as it is to remove emotion and accurately assess the situation that she decided ahead of time that the most important thing was the coming down alive with all your fingers and toes. And even though it was highly emotional in that moment, all the media attention, this first all woman team from America, the pressure on them to get to the summit. And if they turn back, it would be a failure but she got everyone down alive and she made that decision in the moment. And so we have to accurately assess the situation, but it's also important to remove the emotion from the decisions that we make. So number one, accurately assess. And number two is acknowledge the situation. So here's the thing. When I've been married for 32 years now, and it was probably the first, I don't know, five to eight years of our marriage that when my wife would vent about her day at work, then I would listen and then I would try to solve the problem because I'm a problem solver. And what I learned from her over the years, eventually, was that she didn't necessarily want me to solve the problem. She just wanted me to listen and to say, well, that really sucks. I'm sorry that you had to experience that. And so as far as acknowledging the situation, that made her feel better. And with your teachers, Whatever the situation is, the if it's, you know, all of those things that I mentioned about whatever whatever the situation is, teachers leaving, um, you know, we have families that sometimes leave. Um, it could be something to do with the, the financial situation of the school. Whatever the situation is that you're trying to lead them through with hopeful optimism and not toxic positivity, whatever the situation is, your teachers already know that it's bad. Okay, I want to say that again. Your teachers know it's bad and you're not going to be the captain of the Titanic running around saying everything is fine. You have more credibility when your teachers see that you know that it's bad. And so you have to acknowledge it and just say this sucks and I know this is bad. And, you know, obviously we're going to get to laying out a plan and painting a picture, you know, for the future and getting them out of that spot. But really to get it started, it has to do with assessing the situation accurately and acknowledging the situation accurately with your staff. All right, on to number three then, paint the picture of a different future. So what does that mean? I wanna hit you with a quote from a, an article in Psychology Today. It says, hopeful optimism involves a process of anticipating positive circumstances and improved outcomes. Science shows that imagining the future in such ways can help promote human flourishing 
sustaining us through challenges. So just to break that down quickly, hopeful optimism, anticipating the positive outcome that brain science shows that, um, that if you can get your teachers and staff to imagine the future in, a, in that way, to, to, to paint that vivid picture for them to see how this could be different, it actually, according to research, does promote flourishing and sustains us through the challenges. And that's why many schools that were successful in getting through COVID and the, the pandemic um, and coming out on the other side as a healthy, financially stable school with um, a good enrollment and with most of your teachers still on staff, I know there's a million factors in that, and it's not an indictment on you if that's not what happened at your school, but I'm just saying that the leaders that were able to lead through that crisis and lead through that challenge and paint a picture of, we're going to get through this somehow, that they, they were more successful. Here's the problem. Your teachers are stuck. And what I mean by that is if there's a big, bad, negative situation at your school, they're kind of stuck in that loop of negativity focusing on the current situation. And so it's your job to move them off of where they are and to use vivid language to paint a picture of what the future could look like after this situation. And then what does it say? Well, that, that quote I read, you said, quote unquote, it will sustain us through challenges. So if you can be acknowledging the situation, assessing the situation, and then painting a picture of what the future could look like, then you can sustain your staff through the challenge and come out on the other side. Now, we're going to get into some, some planning as far as how to actually execute that. But let's jump to number four, which is, quote unquote, and you're going, we are going to get through this. So it's not necessarily that you actually say those words, although you certainly could say those words. But the idea is, is that you are projecting as the leader that they actually believe that we are going to get through this. So whether you actually say those words or whether you're just living and acting and talking in a way that is building that confidence, you're just projecting that we are going to get through this. And most importantly, you want your teachers to believe that you are going to courageously and effectively lead them through this difficulty. So you are going to get your teachers to believe that you are the person who can courageously and effectively lead them through this. And we'll talk about how to do that in a moment, but you just keep showing up in the meantime as your best self every day and project that you actually understand the current state of affairs, but that you also believe we are going to get through this. And there's something powerful about that combination. If your teachers know that he gets it or know that she gets it as far as how bad it is, but you're projecting this optimism, this hopeful optimism, not toxic positivity, not running around saying, you shouldn't feel that way. Everything's fine. You need to have a more positive attitude. Like I said, that's toxic. It's called toxic positivity for a reason. That's not what we're doing. We are acknowledging the situation, assessing the situation, painting the picture of a different future, showing them that we're going to get through this, and then we are going to set the example. So setting the example is number five on our list of eight ways that we're going to show hopeful optimism and not pox toxic positivity. And I want to share a quote from Dr. Martin Seligman, and he's known as the father of positive psychology. And he defines optimism as, quote, reacting to problems with a sense of confidence and high personal ability. Specifically, optimistic people believe that negative events are temporary, limited in scope, instead of pervading every aspect of a person's life and manageable. So let me just hit you with part of that again, that an optimistic person believes that negative events are temporary, limited in scope, and manageable. So if we apply his definition, then we as leaders of our private schools need to display confidence and skill and a mindset that the current situation is temporary and manageable. 
And we do this in a few ways. We do it by being upbeat, by having positive energy, um, not complaining or wallowing in the misery of the current situation. You can let people vent. You acknowledge that this sucks, that this is bad, this is terrible. I'm so sorry that we are all going through this together, but dot, dot, dot. And then that's when you're painting the picture. That's when you're uh, doing the conversation about, you know, we're going to get through this. That's when you're setting the example. And so even further than that, an optimistic leader skillfully comes up with real plans and strategies to make the situation better. And the whole idea is, is that this situation is temporary and manageable. And that's not diminishing the situation. You're, again, acknowledging it and assessing it accurately. You've got some confidence from your teachers that this person gets it, but then you're going to help them with the plan and help them see that this is temporary and manageable. All right. So on our list, number one, accurately assess the current situation. Number two, acknowledge the current situation. Number three, paint the picture of a different future. Number four, we are going to get through this. Number five, set the example. And number six, perform a belief transplant. So on my notes, belief transplant is in quotes. And so I want to kind of dive into what does it mean to perform a belief transplant? Well, about 25 years ago, I had a veteran social studies teacher, beloved teacher, and he needed a kidney transplant. And he was on all kinds of waiting lists and had been waiting and waiting. And then my first grade, one of my first grade teachers decided that she wanted to see if she was a match and went through the process. And actually she was a match. And one of my first grade teachers donated a kidney to my high school social studies teacher. Well, why did he need a kidney transplant? His kidneys weren't working and he was going to die. And sometimes our teachers need a belief transplant about a situation, especially if they believe that that situation is never going to get better. And so just like that first grade teacher took one good kidney, because we have two, if you have two good kidneys, you can be just fine with one good kidney, gave that kidney to the social studies teacher and then he still, I just was talking to his wife not that long ago, he's still around and still healthy and still doing well, that we sometimes then need to perform a belief transplant. So we're going to take the belief that we have in our own brain, and we're going to transplant that into the hearts and minds of our teachers. And we're going to do that with our attitude. Our attitude is going to perform that belief transplant and change their focus from only looking at the current situation to looking at what is possible. And so we're going to replace, just like the kidney was replaced, we're going to replace their current belief with a different belief and one that is rooted in hopeful optimism. And you say, well, how are we going to do that? Well, that's what we're talking about with painting the vivid picture and setting the example and the words that we use. So a couple more just before we wrap this up. Number seven is validate your teacher's feelings. So, you know, like I said before with my wife, um, I was trying to solve the problem and what I was not doing, I was not validating her feelings. And so with your teachers, what they're going through is very, very difficult. Fill in the blank with whatever that difficulty is at your school. You can reflect on how you led through the pandemic and certainly apply that to the future, the things that you would keep, the things that you will not keep as far as your leadership through the pandemic. But every situation is different and your teachers will react differently. And so I would just say to do this to validate your teacher's feelings. Number one, listen deeply Number two, show empathy. And number three, repeat as often as possible. So listen deeply, show empathy, repeat to validate your teacher's feelings. And that brings us to number eight, and that is get to work. So I know that everyone listening to this podcast works very, very, very hard because you are the leader of an independent school. And so Getting to work is not something that you need to be told to do. You're working really hard. But this is going to be hard. It's going to be very difficult. And back in episode nine, um, which is called 
eight retention strategies that actually work. I mentioned at the beginning of that episode about how in the summer of 2014, our school was facing uh, an enrollment crisis. And we had, I don't remember the stats exactly, I don't have them in front of me, but we had a very large number of families that left our school. Many of them moved to the suburbs and went to public school. Many of them went to other private schools in the region. And we just had a really, really big problem the summer of 2014. And so what we did was we got to work and we did all kinds of things. And that is detailed, the things that we did, the eight things that we did to do the big turnaround that we had at our school are in episode nine. But by spring of 2016, we had a 97% satisfaction rate on the parent survey and our retention rate was back up over 90% and our enrollment was once again healthy. So we went from a crisis in the summer of 2014 to having some really great measurables in the spring of 2016, but it took a lot of work. We did all of the things that I listed above about accurately assessing the situation and and performing a belief transplant and just all of the things um, that we did, but it was a lot of, lot of work. And so um, you can go back and get some great retention strategies, but you can also use episode nine as sort of a case study of what we're talking about today, which is hopeful optimism combined with hard work. And it leads to getting your staff out on the other side of a very difficult situation. So let's talk about the big takeaways of today's episode. Number one, accurately assess the current situation. As hard as it is, we need to try to remove the emotion and accurately assess how bad the problem is. Number two, acknowledge the current situation. Your teachers know that it's bad, so don't be the captain of the Titanic running around saying that everything is fine. That is probably the, the drawing next to toxic positivity in the dictionary. So acknowledge the current situation. Number three, paint the picture of a different future. You're going to use vivid language to paint a picture of what the future looks like after this situation. Number four, we are going to get through this. You want your teachers to believe that you are going to courageously and effectively lead them through this difficult situation. Number five, set the example. So you're going to show up as your best self every day at school, but you also need to display confidence and skill and a mindset that the current situation is temporary and manageable. Number six, perform a belief transplant. You're going to replace their current belief with a different belief and one that is rooted in hopeful optimism. And number seven, validate your teacher's feelings, listen deeply, show empathy and repeat. And number eight, get to work. It is going to be very, very difficult, but it is possible. And so I like to have a call to action in every episode and The call to action is when you're facing a very difficult situation at your school, accurately assess and acknowledge the situation with your staff. You lose credibility when your staff thinks you're out of touch about how bad things really are. So let's wrap it up. I hope that you got some value from this episode. This podcast exists to help you thrive and not just survive as you serve the students and teachers at your school. And just a reminder that I have a free resource for you called the top six ways to protect your school from a lawsuit. It's a PDF with eight pages and lots of valuable information that can keep your students and staff safe and keep you out of court. And you can get that over at the private school slash lawsuit. So please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. I We'll uh, share the show notes and you can grab those at theprivateschoolleader.com slash episode 24. And a new episode of the Private School Leader podcast comes out every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Please connect with me on Instagram at the Private School Leader or Twitter at the PS Leader. And here's a big one. I just really hope that if you got value from this episode that you will please share this episode with one other leader or someone that may be an aspiring leader at your school. And I've been your host, Mark Minkus. I appreciate you and how you're serving your school and the hard work that you're doing. And I really appreciate you taking some of your valuable time to join me here today. 
And I will see you next time on the Private School Leader Podcast. And until then, always remember to serve first, lead second, and make a difference.